You're listening to the Hog Sports Network Daily Podcast. Now, here's your host, Matt Jones. Well, it's Groundhog Day again, and that must mean that we're up here at Gobbler's Knob. And for the Arkansas football team, Gobbler's Knob is AT&T Stadium. After another, uh, it's it's almost uncanny how they lose these games to Texas A&M, 21-17 to on Saturday. And, uh, you know, we talked about this last week. There is there is some bittersweet feelings about the Arkansas A&M game going away for the people who have made it a tradition to go down there. But I don't think anybody's really going to miss it because all the games, Ethan, they just seem to go the same way. The, the whole game Saturday, you're watching it, you know, you get to a certain point, it's like, they're, they're going to let them off the hook again. They're going to let them off the hook, and that's what they did. Uh, Arkansas goes up early in the fourth quarter. A&M responds. They go right back down the field. They score the game-winning touchdown with nine minutes left. Another really rough game for Arkansas offensively. Uh, a lot like the Auburn game, quite frankly. I think A&M's defense is a little bit better than Auburn's defense. Um, they got some issues now, it, it, and they've got to figure out how to fix some of these offensive problems that they have as the the schedule gets really tough now, we we've talked about this for the last month. The schedule really gets tough after September. Now you got Tennessee coming in on Saturday, ranked number four. You get a bye week, then you play LSU, and and, and you know the drill. You've seen the schedule. Uh, look, go back a couple of weeks ago. We said they needed to get at least one out of these two: Auburn and A and M. They did it, but it's still. I think there's still a disappointment from Arkansas's end that they didn't beat A&M because A&M was very beatable on Saturday. For sure, and I've said before the season, I know a lot of people looked at that Week 2 game at Oklahoma State and were like, oh, that's the most important game of the year. Um, Before the year started, I thought Texas A&M was from the jump because it's at such a critical juncture of the season. It's SEC games mean more than your non-conference game. Lost to Oklahoma State that's top 15 preseason or whatever they were um, is forgivable. Um, But you look at Arkansas' schedule after losing to Texas A&M, and you're just trying to find how do you get to six wins. It's just, it's just kind of weird that, you know, we do this with like, oh, how do you get to that bowl? Because do bowls even matter that much anymore? It's more no. like how do you not have a losing season? Um, and I think that it's hard to look at Arkansas' schedule now. and, and have, I mean, things can happen. Arkansas should have a chance against LSU. Should I mean, Ole Miss looks beatable. Missouri looks beatable. There's games that they can still win. But Texas A&M felt really important because – if that game felt like if you do win that, you're in a great position to to, to have a to have a winning season, and you lose that now, and now nothing's kind of uh, you can take nothing for granted. Um, and it, yeah, I looked over in the middle of the third quarter, and I said, "Ah, oh, this is the this is the same script. Like I'm watching the same game I always have." I mean, it to your bowl point, it's kind of like okay, so we're in an election season. You know, the electoral college. It's all about the path to two seventy. When you're a football team in Arkansas's position, it's all about the path to six. How do you get the math to six wins? And, you know, now they've let Oklahoma State off the hook and they've let Texas A&M off the hook. It's hard to get to a bowl game at this point, I feel like. Now, can they do it? Possibly. I mean, they've they've got to win the games that are assumed. They've got to beat Louisiana Tech. They've got to go to Starkville and beat a really bad Mississippi State team. And then you have to pick off a really good team at home potentially – whether that's Tennessee, whether that's Ole Miss, uh, Texas, uh, LSU, I think may be the most winnable of those four games. Maybe you go up to Missouri and win. You know, I don't know what kind of team Missouri really has. I don't know anybody that anybody really knows that just yet. But we know that the Missouri series has been very, you know, it, it's kind of been like a mirror image uh, to the Texas A&M series for the most part uh, since those teams came into the SEC. The path to six. Uh, if, if they don't get there at the end of the year, they're going to be looking back at this Oklahoma State game and they're going to be looking back at these tech, at the Texas A&M game and think those are two games where we really let a team off the hook. I think Oklahoma State more so than Texas A&M because, uh, quite frankly, they played a lot better over in Stillwater Texas than they did Saturday. I, I left the game Saturday thinking Texas A&M was the better team. Yeah, I didn't uh, leave yeah. that against Oklahoma State no. that way, but I do think Arkansas let and, 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 and that's kind of proven itself, I feel like, with Oklahoma State. I mean, look at what the – uh, the last few weeks have been like for them. They beat Tulsa, but they didn't beat them the way I think a lot of people thought they should. Played competitive with Utah, and then they didn't play very good at all against Kansas State the other day. That looks like a team that's probably going to end up like you know maybe seven and five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought Arkansas had a better team than Oklahoma State. They just 
made too many mistakes. And, and that was a problem again uh, Saturday against Texas A&M. The turnovers are killing this team. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that Taylor Green is committing turnovers at a really high rate and the fact that defensively they are not forcing turnovers. You take away the Auburn game, and I mean Auburn's handing out turnovers like Halloween candy a month early. Uh, you take away that game, Arkansas's defense hasn't been able to to take you know, almost get any takeaways this year. Yeah, I think they have two aside from the Auburn game, which two over how they're four three and two now. Two over four games is yeah, it, it, that's not winning yeah, football. Um, but you know, and I think that what's so you know, this is what makes people puzzled is the fact that there's two games that Arkansas loses that feels like they very well could have won, especially Oklahoma State. Texas A&M definitely had chances to win. You're up 17-14 in the fourth quarter. Win those, you're 5-0, and and you're literally ranked like, <laughs> who even knows how high right mm -hmm. now? And you have a big game against Tennessee coming to town. I think that's what's so frustrating to people is people feel like Arkansas doesn't have a bad football team that feels like they have one that doesn't know how to close exactly. in crunch time. They don't have a closer. I mean, yeah. look at it like baseball. Baseball, if you don't have a closer, you're going to let a, an opposing offense break your heart in the eighth or ninth inning. Yeah. And that's what keeps continually happening to this football team. They don't have that closer mentality. And and they're not able to finish these games, whether it be Oklahoma State or whether it be uh, Texas A&M. Auburn, they did finish. And, you know, last year they finished the Florida game. But too many times last year – they just couldn't finish games, whether it be BYU or LSU or Ole Miss or Alabama. Uh, you know, when they've got these teams on the ropes, Mississippi State. I don't know if they ever had Mississippi State on the ropes, but it, it was a close game at the end. They just can't. They they just couldn't make the plays. Uh, they made the plays against Auburn. Give them credit for that. Even against UAB, even though that game shouldn't have been uh, as close as it was at the end. They're not a bad team. They just don't know how to finish games, and they're going to end up with a, a a bad record potentially. Or they are going to end up with a bad record unless they can finish out or, or they can figure out in season how to finish these games better. Yeah, and here's the crazy thing about – I mean, we talk about these one-possession losses under Sam Pittman. I went back and I looked at all of them last night. Arkansas was two years ago. It's just crazy how this series against Texas A&M is so critical. I feel like it's the turning point of so, many, of so many seasons. Going into the Texas A&M game – two years ago, the one that K.J. Jefferson fumbled over the goal line, and mm -hmm. that changed everything. Mm -hmm. Arkansas was 4-5 and five under Sam Pittman in one possession games heading into that game. And it should have been 5-4 and four because of the Auburn game in 2020. Yes. So, 4-5. and five. But since Could then. Could have been 5-4. and four. But since then. Since then, the that, that loss since then, Arkansas is 2-11. and 11. That would, counting the take, Texas A&M loss, mm -hmm. two and eleven in one possession games. Like I don't know, that play broke the Razorbacks in close games. I don't know. You know, and it's weird because they have won some close games. Like Auburn was not a one possession game, but Auburn was a one possession game until about three minutes left. And so that stat can be manipulated a little bit. You know, I mean, the, the, they have won a close game this year. They've really won two close games because UAB was a close game too. But you're right. The what I think the one possession stat. What I think it really magnifies more than anything else is just when it gets the, the when you're in a one possession game, when it gets down to that time, the final two minutes, three minutes of a game, and it's time to make a play, whether it be offensively or defensively, they just have not been able to do it. I think quarterback play uh, is is a big factor in this. Mm -hmm. Green has not been great in crunch time this year. I mean, you think about the Auburn game; they go on that game winning touchdown drive. What they do? They ran it every play after he threw two incompletions. Two incompletions, a pass interference. Now, he had some of those runs, but you've got to have a quarterback that can pass it in those situations. And whether it be his own fault and there's some fault at, at, at his feet, you think about the throw he missed in overtime against Oklahoma State, or whether it be the fault of the offensive line, which I want to get into that here in just a minute, uh, the passing game just is broken in critical in, in in the critical stretch of the game, even UAB there weren't a whole lot of big pl big pass plays in the second half of that game. They just leaned on UAB with their run game. Uh, the the pass game is is a huge concern for this team. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's it, it kind of puzzled me toward the end of the game. You know, it felt like Arkansas maybe should run the ball more than they were. I'm not gonna sit over here and just you know say what Bobby Petrino should have done, but. It felt like they had started to maybe get a little bit more success on the ground when they were running it. I know uh, Jaquin and Jackson started getting a little bit bigger gains. Braylon Russell came in there, had a like decent gains. Like the type of gains that keep a defense susceptible to 
then hitting him with a pass. And it just felt like toward the end of the game, the the offense was all in Taylor Green's hands of make it, make some throws, and he just didn't. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. It just it felt to me like Arkansas maybe abandoned the run a little bit earlier um, than they needed to, but. Then again, it's all coulda, woulda, shoulda. Arkansas lost another one possession game, and it just felt like the same old script. This is what Sam Pittman had to say after the game, thanks to our uh, friends at Hogs Plus for this video clip. Uh, you know, we just couldn't find consistency offensively. Uh, played really well the first half defensively, um, besides the one explosive that they had. You know, we should have just been able to get him on the ground. Um, played. Pretty well penalty wise in the first half, second half, not so much at times. Uh, but the effort was good. Uh, uh, these kind of games like like this, you know, we got to find a way to win. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the close games. It, it's it, and that's that's the story of almost every head coach. I feel like is the head coaches that you remember real well. They're the coaches who can win the close games. The coaches that you don't remember very well. They're the coaches that can't. I, I mean. We've read this stat here on, on the set before. Sam Pittman, 6-16 six and 16 in one-possession games. Brett Bielema wasn't good. Chad Morris was 0-7 in one-possession, or 1-7 in one-possession games because he beat Portland State. <laughs> but, uh, you know, John L. Smith's here. They weren't good in one-possession games. Bobby Petrino, they were very good. Houston Nutt, 22-20 and 20 in one-possession games. It's the difference in how we remember coaches is how they, they, they perform in these close games. Yep, and it's... And that's the difference between a four and eight and an eight and fourteen. And you don't even have to take like that's the, the thing is the staggering number right now with, with six and sixteen is you just literally throw a few of those over in the win column and it doesn't even have to be at fifty percent and you feel a lot better about some of these uh seasons. It's that they're just not winning the I mean, even the one they're they won, losing so many of yeah. them in succession. And and even the one that they won last year against Florida, that took that was luck that florida yeah, had that Trey whole Smack situation a field goal and yeah and they mismanagement of the clock at the end like arkansas got very lucky to catch a break in that one to not lose another one it's it, it almost feels like right now arkansas has to get run into a team that also doesn't know how to win a close game you wrote pff grades or, or you looked at the pff grades and, and really the thing that stood out i think to me and a lot of people was the the pass protection issues that arkansas is having taylor green has been pressured or hurried in 80 dropbacks this year out of 192, and the next closest in the SEC is 49. That just kind of shows how frequently this is happening. Uh, you know, I looked at the numbers a little bit earlier. I think it was 80 out of 192. Am I right? Uh, yeah, 80 out of 192. That's 41.7% of the times that he drops back to pass. Uh, he's getting pressured. Mm -hmm. You just you, you can't have a passing game that's going to succeed like that. He's been really good at getting outside the pocket and making some plays on those times when he's being pressured. But the defenses are going to get a lot better. The, the defensive athletes are a lot better. And we saw that against Texas A&M. And I feel like you're going to see that against Tennessee. I feel like you're going to see that against LSU. And you just go on down the list. They've got to figure out some ways to, to protect this quarterback. Or one, the passing game isn't going to be effective. Or two, he may end up getting hurt as, as many hits as he's taken. Mm -hmm. And it's... You know, they're on a gauntlet of good defensive lines. I mean, that's what happens when you get an SEC play. But it's like I looked at the Auburn, going into Auburn, I was like, oh, best defensive line they've played yet. Then I thought this past week, oh, Texas a and gets even a little bit better. This week against Tennessee, I think they have one of the best defensive lines in the nation. So it's if, if you don't figure it out at some point, it's just going to keep on being the same old story. I mean, it, it might be one of those things that, like, hey, they might just not know how to protect. <laughs> like, that might just be – a theme and it's I'm telling like might as well just go ahead and say it right now this might be a thing that happens all season long and mm -hmm. people are going to be hearing the same complaint for the rest of the year D Nick Scorton who had the big uh, takeaway at the end of the game did you hear what he said he said that basically he was able to anticipate what Taylor Green was going to do uh, because they're seeing it so much on film it seems like not every drop back but on most drop backs he's rolling out to his right and he's done a poor job, it feels like, of, of sensing that pressure coming from behind him. He, it happened uh, you know, a couple of times against A&M. One time, uh, Keyshawn uh, Blackstock recovered a fumble that would actually aided an Arkansas scoring drive. 
But we've seen this too many times, it feels like, this year, where he gets hit blindside. He just doesn't feel that pressure, and, and he's not holding on to the ball well enough. And that was the, the play that ultimately you know, ended up not costing Arkansas the game, but they never got another chance to win it after A&M made that play late. Yeah, how do you feel pressure whenever it's coming at your back and you can't see it? I mean, that that sack fumble was not tailing, in my opinion, wasn't tailing Green's fault. He Carmona, yeah. Carmona got he got. There's no bad. way to to like you just have a free rusher coming from the backside and Taylor Green's trying to make a play down the field. He can't see the guy behind him. And I mean, Taylor Green has a lot of faults. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like Saturday he was just in a bad position to even try to succeed. The 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 protection was so bad Saturday against A and M that the Aggies had a play where they blew up a handoff. Yes. How many times do you see that where a guy is back there so fast? that the quarterback can't hand it to his running back because somebody's hitting him yeah. at that point. That play, I think, more than maybe any other in the game, encapsulated how how poor the protection was, the, the blocking was up front and for that, Arkansas. that was the Arkansas versus Texas A&M play that you wait for every single yeah. year, the one that changes the game because all of a sudden Arkansas's mistake gives Texas A&M Great point. the ball and field. And, and they, Texas A&M wasn't moving the ball just offensively on possessions. I mean, Arkansas's defense was playing well, and then all of a sudden you gift them the ball and, uh, and goal situation. So that was the play. Got a lot more coming up. Arkansas A&M on Saturday we'll discuss. We want to tell you first, though, that uh, Matt Zimmerman's going to be at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club this week, Wednesday at noon. Home two suites in Springdale. You can reserve your seat now at ozarkstix.com, O-Z-A-R-K-S-T-I-X.com. Matt Zimmerman on uh, Thursday. I'm sorry. I, I said Wednesday. Thursday at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club, October 3rd. We're moving our luncheons from Wednesday to Thursday during the month of October. Uh, we'll also have Kyle May there on October 17th, Peyton Hillis on October 24th, Mike Neighbors on Halloween, October 31st. And on tomorrow's show, we're scheduled to have Houston Nutt with us. It'll be uh, interesting to talk to him. We'll talk to him about what he's seen from the Razorbacks through five games. Also, we'll talk to him about this new Hogs Plus documentary, Redemption, that's coming out uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I got a chance to watch that over the weekend, and uh, you're going to want to catch that, a, a very good uh, view of that 1999 Tennessee game. Very timely with the volunteers coming to Fayetteville this weekend. We got a lot more from Arkansas AM. Also, we'll talk about the Razorbacks and volunteers coming up. But first, a word from our sponsors. Want to enjoy your life again? Burning, numbness, and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities. Neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life. Come see what we can do at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Uptown Rogers. We can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life. Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King, we are Soapbox, we are shop cart. We are design. Hey, welcome back. We want to tell you about our friends over at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute. They are your source for holistic wellness and your healthy lifestyle changes. They're located in Uptown Rogers, and the staff at Enhanced Healthcare will target your specific health plan for wellness, from neuropathy treatment, primary care, weight loss, and so much more. You can count on the experts at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Rogers. Arkansas offensively really bad Saturday against Texas A&M. We'll pull out the efficiency ratings and, and tell you how this went. Arkansas scored 17 points on 13 possessions. That's not a good number. Now, A&M not a whole lot better, uh, 21 points on 12 possessions. And the way we look at a possession is that if it, um, you know, like say A&M's last drive where they have the half that ends it, we don't count that. Uh, so, 12, 21 points and 12 possessions for, for Texas A&M, 17 and 13 for Arkansas. Neither of these numbers are very good. And we don't have a whole lot of SEC data yet to kind of tell you what the, the best teams are in terms of offense and defense. For instance, Tennessee, uh, you know, their offensive possessions against Oklahoma, they scored 23 points and 15 drives. That's not very good, but Oklahoma's got a really good defense. Tennessee's offense or Tennessee's defense looks really good because Oklahoma's offense couldn't move the ball at all against the Volunteers uh, over in Norman a couple of weeks ago, but they've only played one SEC game. Uh, hopefully, here in the next week or two, we'll start putting out these efficiency ratings. 
which, which I think are fun because they kind of give you an idea of what kind of game you're going to get. I used the Power 4 games for Arkansas and A&M to tell us what, we, what kind of game we might get between the Razorbacks and the Aggies. It said Arkansas would win 25 to 21, so it got A&M right. It really just it, needed it just, Arkansas to put It score needed Arkansas to score another touchdown. Yeah. That's exactly right. And if it yeah, which I guess that, that plays into the, to, you know, we're talking about adding data to this. That I think that it'll learn that Texas A&M I think has a pretty good defense I think and so, so yeah. It all like you said over the next few weeks will kind of start to sort itself out. But I think it's an it's really a interesting thing to look at. It never gets in my opinion, it never gets it really, really wrong, which is key. Like it, it'll tell you. I got gen- Auburn wrong last year. Well, I <laughs> mean, I guess on your scores, there's, I'm saying there's a few. I'm saying as far as like who's good at offense, who's good at defense. That's, that's Whenever right. you look at them at the end, like you can get a good idea of who the best offensive teams what in the does, SEC I, are. I mean, what it does is it takes into account the number of points that you are scoring relative to your opportunities. Yeah, and you know, some weeks that's going to be a little bit better than others, but you know, I mean, for the most part. Your average is your average, and, yeah. and so it, it, it does a pretty good job of finding that. But Arkansas, uh, its offensive efficiency, not good right now. I mean, even against Auburn, it wasn't good. 24 points and 12 possessions, that's that's not great. Against Oklahoma State, they had 31 points in how many possessions? Was it like 15? Yeah, it, it wasn't a, a great number over at Oklahoma State either. Yeah, their problem is they're, they're – They're getting a lot of opportunities yeah. with the ball. They're just not doing anything with them. Some – flowery yardage numbers at times but hey yards are a dime a the, dozen put it in the end zone yards are a dime yep. a dozen it's yep. all about what you can do scoring the ball yeah and i will say this having a good kicker helps you in these offensive or offensive efficiency ratings and trusting your kicker i thought the you know the the fake field goal against texas a&m was a a poor decision by arkansas because you're within Ramsey's range. We've seen him make a 51 yarder outdoors in kind of a weird weather or a wind a weird wind situation over at Stillwater a few weeks back, you're indoors, not facing the sun, which I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think that affected Arkansas a whole lot going into the sun, but it certainly, you know, it, it when you're going into the sun at AT&T Stadium, it, it can create a little bit of an issue. He had the sun at his back. He's indoors. Why not take the points in a tie game there? Yeah, and I'm – There are about three or four, you know, pretty questionable coaching decisions that, that I can address yeah. here. Well, in – but I liked the least about that. I mean, I learned this back playing just Madden. You don't call your timeouts in the third quarter ever. I don't care what you like. Now, you, the you, play clock was running down on them. I don't. At they, that point, if you aren't sure, why not just like punt it? And you hadn't been winning field possession at all that quarter. Punt mm-hmm. it and finally get the field possession battle where you want it, or just trust your kicker. I guess. I mean, they were scrambling. It looks like they were out of sorts. Looked like they had the personnel kind of different. I think they had somebody come in who wasn't supposed to be in there. Oh, it was Andrew Armstrong. He ran in. He wasn't supposed to be on the field. Then he runs off, and then they bring somebody else. And after all of that, there's only like two seconds. They yeah. weren't going to get the snap off. At some point, if you don't know what you want to do, I'm just like punt it and win the field possession battle. I just don't think – I see so many times a team will call a timeout in the third quarter, and it bites them in the butt. Arkansas got to the end of that game, and even with the two-minute warning timeout. step, it was yeah. like need another timeout to try and win this. I mean, of course – a and M uh, ended up getting the first down, so that was all whatever. But they, that would have costed Arkansas in crunch time another like forty seconds had they. Take, yeah, take your points. I mean, take your points when you get an opportunity. And they had already run a fake in that mm-hmm. game. I feel like if you get a successful fake, it's kind of like a successful onside kick. If you're successful once, I mean, you're you're really rolling the dice yeah. trying to be well, successful and twice. Mike Elko is very honest, and he was like, "Yeah, that that, that he knew it was coming. He knew it was coming, and yeah. he." he just as much as he said that he they didn't expect the the they just weren't ready for the fake punt mm-hmm. on the rugby style. Um, he's I mean that wasn't even a designed fake. Um, it just he saw it was there. Um, but he, they were ready for that fake. They, they switched knew that, up their look. Yeah, they switched up their look. They knew that it was at the like the edge of Ramsey's range. Mm-hmm. So it, it yeah it was a questionable thing. And like I said, it's just that in that game field possession was so important or field position was so important. The other, the other decision I didn't like was Arkansas was facing fourth and eight, about a little under six minutes to play, fourth quarter, and they're at the A&M 42. How many times have they been at the A&M 42 the entire game? Not very many. They didn't cross midfield, but like I, I mean, a few times. Yeah, I mean, midfield was like a moat getting yeah. across there for the Razorbacks on Saturday. And they're at the A&M 42, fourth and eight. You're putting a lot of confidence in your defense to get you the ball back at that point. And you haven't been at that point on the field. Why not just go for it? 
mm-hmm. they're from the 42. And I understand that, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I'm not making the calls, and I'm, <laughs> I totally understand that. But in the moment, watching it, I felt like they need to go for this. And they didn't, and they got a great punt from Devin Bell, knocked A&M inside its own one-yard line. But if that ball takes a different bounce, you only gain like 20 yards, 22 yards in, uh, you know, in um, – well, I mean, maybe not even that many, depending on how the fourth mm-hmm. the fourth down play goes. And so if you're trusting your defense to get you the ball back, why not trust them anywhere on the field? And I understand A&M could have gone down and they could have scored a touchdown, they could have kicked a field goal, whatever. Arkansas had not been moving the ball. And that possession was actually a, a decent possession for them. I think they've got, they had gotten a first down or two first downs on that possession. And so why not you know take your chances right there and go for the win? Yeah, because in my opinion, that it- – by punting it, you're trusting your defense to get you the ball back really quick. Like I mm-hmm. think that they want to get you know punt it from your own end zone and get it back. And equally, like basically, I think Arkansas thought that they could pin them down there and then the defense get a stop and get the ball back around where they had just punted from first and ten. But at the same point, at the same time, you're trusting your defense to do the same thing from the forty two as you're needing them to do from the from the one. Mm-hmm. You know, you just need the ball back quick. Um, yeah, by by not going for it there, it was a little bit of, you know, you had seen Arkansas not be conservative so many times in that game, mm-hmm. just rolling the dice going for it. And then, you know, six minutes left and you're in A and M territory and that was yeah, didn't come often. I mean, fourth and eight, it's an obvious passing down. They're not protecting Taylor <laughs> Green. I, I get it. I understand why they made the decision they did. The defense played a pretty good game, I thought, on Saturday, and that, that leads into the third coaching decision. It's the, the decision to put the second team defensive line and on the field. And a few third. Uh, with, oh, that's Danny right. Danny Siley. Yeah, that's right. So, but anyway, but basically they took, all, they took all of their defensive line starters off for the first seven plays of A&M's eight-play touchdown drive that ultimately won the game in the fourth quarter. And that, uh, and I understand rotating linemen, you know, but they said that they wanted their their second team in there because they were more fresh. Didn't make a lot of sense, though, because Arkansas, they'd been on a long scoring drive. I think A&M had gone three and out on its previous offensive drive. You had a change of quarter in between there. I mean, those defenders, if they're not fresh at that point in the fourth quarter, it it doesn't, I don't know, it just, like you said, it doesn't really, it it doesn't, it doesn't stand up to, to logic a whole lot, the fact that they, they felt like their first team defensive line would not have been fresh enough uh, to play, you know, that possession. And it just feels to me like you just get the lead. Now you got momentum, get your best players in there and try to make some plays to win this dadgum thing. And the fact that they had their, their second team line out there or their third team line in some situation or in in some instances. uh, Yeah, that just, it felt weird. And I looked at, I looked up some of the plays there. So they've got, uh, they've got Quincy Rhodes in, for most of that possession, Anton Junkaj, Danny Salee, uh, 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 Rose, the defensive tackle was in there. They brought Charlie Collins in at some point during that that drive. You know, I just look at this play by play: no pressure, a short pass to the sideline. There was a play where uh, Rhodes flushed Reed to his blind side, but he found a, a lane and hit a pass for 15 yards. There was a play where uh, Kivi Rose makes a good move, but he missed the running back in the hole. And instead of it being a, a negative yardage play, all of a sudden it makes it, um, um, you know, a little bit of you know positive yardage. Junkaj on the next play misses a tackle that made it third and more manageable. Uh, Saley missed a tackle on the big run by Le'Veon Moss. So the fact that they had the defensive linemen in there, I mean, these guys were missing some tackles on that drive. And I thought, you know, for the most part, Arkansas's first team defenders, especially Landon Jackson, played a really good game. Yeah, and let's rewind a little bit from that possession right there. The last time Arkansas's defense had seen the field, Texas A&M had, like we said, for either team getting in the other team's territory was big that game. I mean, mm-hmm. it just was. A&M had been on the march the drive before and got in Arkansas territory, and Landon Jackson made two two huge plays to get it like fourth and 24. All the momentum's on the offensive side. It's tied ball game, 14-14, or all the momentum's on Arkansas' side when they get the ball on offense. Arkansas goes and takes the lead, and... Yeah, from the time that Landon Jackson, that fourth and 24 possession ended, it was like two minutes, almost three minutes left in the third quarter. Get off the field. The offense gets the ball, and they go on a, a lengthy drive that includes the timeout in the middle of the quarter. Like, mm-hmm. these defensive linemen are on the sideline. Like, I think that we look at how much game time went off because it's, like, hard to track, you know, physical minutes. But they went through a lengthy – 
uh, go ahead drive from the offense and a fourth quarter like timeout just in general like there was a lot of time it just yeah it's it just doesn't make a ton of sense whenever a guy like Danny Siley entering Saturday's game had three defensive snaps on the year played Charlie Collins had five yeah it's just and he's playing in that position and I get it that you want to keep your guys fresh it just seemed like a weird point in the game I was talking to a former player after the game he said if it's me I am pounding on my coach's shoulder saying get me the hell in the game right there if I'm one of those first team defensive linemen and they don't come in the game until it's uh, first and goal from the five. Yeah, uh, just 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 odd. And you know, in those little coaching decisions like that, those are the things that add up. And that you know, it feels like we've seen just a whole lot in the last couple of years. And they add up, and 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 that's that may be why you have the the record that you have in the close games. Yeah, and it's you know finally the, you know it's an eight play drive that A and M goes on to take the lead. Arkansas gets their starters in for the very last play and the first and goal from the five and on that play there was actually probably a missed holding call in texas a&m that i mean it going back and looking at it should have been holding and so the arkansas starting defense had one play on that drive and they you know a&m probably got away with with something there um but it just feels like that is i mean you look at the end of the game that's the drive that gave the winning team the win and arkansas had to not have its best guys out there and that's just i i i think that it makes sense if in like the second or third quarter you're rotating guys to keep them fresh and it's like here and there this was an entire drive in the fourth quarter you had just taken the lead it, that's what's so questioning or puzzling to me it's like landon jackson just sat on the sideline for the entire game winning drive he looked like he belonged in an nfl stadium yeah and just didn't have him out there <laughs> but don't you know. don't have him out there in crunch yeah. it, it's it's very puzzling how yeah. many times in one of Arkansas's close games, did you say – because, you know, like sometimes there's a close game and you say, man, we just ran out of time. We just, If we could have just gotten the ball back, you knew we were going to go down there and win the game. Or, you know, maybe there's a play like we talked about with Auburn in 2020 where it was clearly a misofficiated play that cost your team the game. How many times do we feel like that's happened to Arkansas? It just feels like, for the most part, what's happening is that you go back and you kind of – dissect and analyze the end of these these end of game situations and you say they just got outplayed in crunch time by the other team doesn't it feel like that's yeah, the case they just and i think we said at the top of the show they just they outplayed needed. auburn i think it's important to keep keep mentioning that because they did play outplay auburn at the end of the week before but in these other two very winnable games against oklahoma state and texas a&m they just got outplayed down the yeah. stretch and we said it at the top but I think they just needed a finisher. They literally – it felt like Arkansas had sneakily gotten a 17-14 a to 14 lead in the fourth quarter and was like, wow, Arkansas, are they doing the reverse where they have a lead that they maybe shouldn't have at this point? They just didn't have a finisher. They just couldn't get the job done. And it's – you know, you see it happen once, whatever. See it twice, whatever. Once it's happened, you know, how many times in the past two years, yeah, there's there's got to be some sort of – program trend there yeah yeah uh, it's a it's a pattern it's yeah. a pattern that's for sure so. more coming up after these words from our sponsors want to enjoy your life again burning numbness and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life come see what we can do at enhanced healthcare wellness institute in uptown rogers we can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King, we are Soapbox, we are shop cart. We are design. Hey, welcome back. We want to tell you about our friends over at Bentonville Glass. They've been serving their community since 1971. They are committed, professional, and versatile. If you're looking for a quality leader in Northwest Arkansas or looking for skilled craftsmanship, look no further than Bentonville Glass for all your glass market needs and the highest quality products. Come by and see them right now at 507 South Main in Bentonville or online at bentonvilleglass.com. Arkansas and Tennessee is going to be a 630 kickoff 
on Saturday night. ABC will televise this. There was some some. Um, this wasn't finalized going into the weekend. This got finalized after the weekend's games. Uh, Florida State and Clemson was also being uh, considered for that 6:30 uh, primetime spot on ABC. It'll be put on ESPN instead. Florida State, my goodness. I mean, Red Lashley, good. the former Razorback, uh, he just whipped Mike Norvell up and down the field the other night. And SMU did. Uh, beating Florida State down in uh, in Dallas, forty two to sixteen, I think was the final score of that game. Lastly's got quite a team going right now. I, I thought they would struggle in ACC play, and honestly, they haven't. I, I think Florida State was actually their ACC opener. I don't think they played any other ACC teams, but they're four and one right now. They've got to win over Florida State, which I know Florida State is is not what we thought they were going to be. They beat TCU the week before, fifty six to twenty eight. Really, just you know, mopped the floor with TCU. Uh, looks like he might have a pretty good team going there. Yeah, I think wasn't there a lone loss BYU? That sounds right. And it was, you know, a game that they had a shot pretty to close. Win. Pretty, yeah, pretty. They are in the mix for the ACC. And BYU's a good team. Yeah, BYU's a very, very good team. BYU's undefeated. They may be in the the Big Twelve title chase now yeah. after Utah lost the other night. And I know there's a lot of games that still have to be played. I was but. looking at SMU's football schedule the other day, and they have a very nice schedule moving forward too. Here's the rest of their games on their ACC schedule: Louisville this week at Louisville. That's a big game for them. At Stanford, at Duke versus Pitt versus Boston College at Virginia versus Cal. Mm. That's a type of schedule that you can find yourself. <laughs> dumb, don't. Look yeah. now, but uh, I, I, you can maybe I sneak your way into the playoff. Anyway, Rhett Lashley, the former Razorback, doing well there and, and maybe helped Arkansas get a primetime spot against Tennessee. Obviously, Tennessee is the draw. Uh, the Volunteers are number four in this week's AP poll. Texas A&M actually fell a spot to a tie for 25th in the AP poll with another team who's got a Razorback connection, Barry Odom and UNLV. Uh, they won big over the weekend against Fresno State after all of the, the off-field stuff that they went through last week. Uh, was a, a very impressive performance, I thought, by UNLV the other day to, to win that game the way that they did. I think the final score was something like 59-14 to 14, uh, that they won. And so A&M falls to number 25, Tennessee up to number 4. Uh, here's a trivia question for you. Do you know the last time that Arkansas beat a top-four team in Fayetteville? Um, no. 25 years ago, Tennessee was number 3, and that was the redemption game that we talked about. A little bit earlier, Sterner to Lucas. So I was negative one not, years old. You know, not saying it'll happen. And certainly, Tennessee is a huge favorite. I saw where they uh, opened up as a twelve and a half point favorite on Sunday. But uh, Chris Fowler, Kirk Herbstreit are going to be on the call. First time that they have been in Fayetteville uh, as a as a booth tandem ever. They were here for game day against Tennessee in two thousand six, but that was before either of them had moved into uh, you know calling games. Uh, they have called some Razorback games in Arkansas. They were actually on the call for an 0-3 game against South Carolina, a three-man booth along with Lee Corso, one of those Thursday night games back when Thursday night college football games were actually a little bit of a draw. They're not anymore. Uh, and then uh, they, they've been on the call for some other Arkansas SEC games in other stadiums. They were at Alabama in 17. They were at Georgia in 21. They were at LSU uh, last year. But this is the – I mean, I know some people don't like them. Everybody's got their own preferences – but this is the big name, uh, big name um, announced duo in college football, and they're going to have Arkansas's game uh, in Fayetteville. You look at it, and it just makes you think this was set up to if Arkansas beat A and M to be college game day. It, it's just what it feels maybe, like. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. I mean, they they're even, going to Berkeley. I know Herb Street scheduled this week. He will go to. Uh, he'll he'll be Thursday night. He'll watch your Falcons play in Atlanta against the Buccaneers. Right? The Buccaneers. That's right, and then. I don't know if he still goes to his son's high school games, but I know that there was a time where he was like flying to those and then flying to the game day site overnight. Uh, his son's a, a real highly recruited quarterback in the Cincinnati area, uh, but they've got game day in Berkeley, California Saturday. That's not a short flight from Berkeley to Fayetteville. So, you know, he'll, he'll step off the game day set. He'll get his police escort to a, a private airstrip somewhere in the Berkeley area. And then he'll get on one fly out to Drake field and, and get a police escort yeah. into Razorback stadium. That cuts it pretty close though. I, yeah, I just have a feeling. Look, it felt like watching game day as well. They said something about like if Arkansas wins, they could be a really mm. big game next week for Sam. Pitt. Like the it was the way they said it. Well, we'll never know. We'll never know. But I think that having this the A team, Arkansas would have maybe been ranked. Who knows? Maybe very, very much a maybe. But you know, it's a, one of those what ifs. 
Hey, some other sports. We'll get back to Razorback football here in just a minute, but some other sports. Arkansas uh, basketball is officially now playing Baylor at American Airlines Center in Dallas. It's going to be a November 9th game, and it's been set for a 6.30 p.m. tip-off on ESPNU. So, uh, football disappointment in the Dallas area over the weekend. Maybe basketball can can make it feel better uh, in a few weeks when they play Baylor down at uh, in, in downtown. That's the home of the Mavericks and the Dallas Stars. Again, 6.30 p.m. on ESPNU on November 9th. That's the second of Arkansas's bye weeks. Uh, over the weekend, Razorback Soccer ranked number one. They beat South Carolina, and I don't know that I've ever seen this happen against a quality team, Ethan. They beat South Carolina 2 to nothing. Carolina, one of the, the really good SEC soccer programs, they're a team that, that challenges to be in the College Cup. They didn't get a shot on goal. I, I, watched, I, was, I was driving home from Dallas for the, the first half of this game, I was able to watch the second half. Uh, just a, a really impressive performance from Arkansas soccer program. This Arkansas soccer team, they're always good. This one, they just, look legitimate. This one feels even better than normal. Well, it's, we talked to Kelly Rolliard on our uh, program last week, uh, the former Razorback goalkeeper who calls their games on SEC Network, and she said this is the best Arkansas soccer team I've ever seen. Yeah. And that says something because I thought they've had some some pretty good programs. They've had some, some good really good players and re- really good teams and really good players, and it just this year just feels even different. I don't know if I sh- should be going off the field, but, you know, it, it just seems like they are really taking care of business. I, At this point in most soccer seasons, I feel like they've dropped one game to, or, t- or t- dropped or tied to somebody that they probably shouldn't have. That hasn't happened yet. So. Well, and the only team that they have tied was Michigan State, who's ranked number one in the coaches poll this week. Yeah. Arkansas ranked number two. Michigan State had two draws last week, and the thought is that Arkansas might be a unanimous number one uh, whenever the coaches' poll is updated this week. By the way, the Razorbacks on Thursday go to Mississippi State, and Mississippi State ranked number nine nationally. Yeah. So that's a, a big undefeated game for them. in SEC. They're only only two undefeated in SEC. Well, so, I guess Tennessee's unbeaten, but they've tied twice. Arkansas's got a good team. I mean, that's that's the point. They are scoring goals at a really high rate, and they're not allowing a lot of goals. Uh, they're they're. They, this looks like a legit team. If you haven't watched them, I would tell you uh, to, to get out and, and get a look at that team. You went out and saw a softball team Friday night. What were your what were your takeaways? Well, they were definitely uh, – Seminole State College was overmatched. Just, I mean, Arkansas was just way better than them. But uh, the the main thing that's said is this freshman pitcher, Cam Harrison, mm-hmm. oh, my goodness, she brings – smoke in there as far as I mean she can throw a rise ball really really fast and uh yeah she's good she faced six batters and all six struck out swinging I mean it was uh for softball baseball comparison I was watching Hagen Smith out there (laughs) just strikeout machine Uh, we're going through a bunch of sports now we cover all the sports uh, at wholehogsports.com hope you'll uh, take a look at our website if if you're interested in reading about these Razorback volleyball got a sweep this weekend they beat uh, Georgia and then they beat Ole Miss. Uh, that uh, that team is off to a really good start. I think they're twelve and two right now. And then coming up this week out at the Blessings in Johnson, uh, you've got the Blessings Collegiate Invitational. This is always uh, they always seem to have a pretty good lineup out there of golfers. A lot of SEC teams will be there, and this will be on Golf Channel all week. Golf Channel coverage is going to start at three thirty on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday out at the Blessings. This Blessings Collegiate Invitational. Uh, this has kind of become an annual. A pit stop for a lot of teams on their fall uh, golf schedule. Uh, John Tyson's golf course uh, is, is always a – it's become a, a very nice host for this event. Yeah, I've covered it a couple times really, really – like they run it just so well. And it's cool seeing it on the um, golf channel. I mean, it's just – it's such a big-time feel. So, yeah. anyway. you know, They had the NCAA tournament out there – or the, uh, the NCAA championships out there in 2019. And I think that was kind of – that's what kind of maybe – spurred this on a little bit it was you know the idea that hey this this could be a, a course that that becomes a it can have a a big time college golf tournament there yeah and i event. think that it's one thing i've noticed from the past few years covering it it seems like it's a pretty the, like the greens there are really challenging and arkansas's teams always like <laughs> i feel like almost always win this because they're so used to that course and it's a it's a challenging course for other teams that haven't played on it i think SEC games this weekend, football, Missouri goes to Texas A&M. That's an interesting game. Talk about game day. I mean, that would have been a good place for them, but they've already been to College Station this year. 
You got a couple of ranked teams there. Uh, you know, and the winner, I think, comes out of that game feeling pretty good about their, you know, potential playoff chances down the back half of the, the season. Auburn goes to Georgia. Uh, mm, wouldn't want to be the Tigers this week. I think they'd only win that game seven out of ten times. Ole Miss goes to South Carolina. Alabama will be at Vanderbilt. And uh, UCF goes to Florida. K.J. Jefferson going back to the Swamp. A very interesting game, uh, obviously, with Florida and its struggles. But UCF, they got hammered the other night as a favorite at home by Colorado. Yep. That was one of the, you know, you look at your scores every single weekend, and there's always one or two that just pop out to you. That was the one that did to me. I, I couldn't believe that they got beat that bad. I think we were on the phone whenever you saw that. You, you're the... <laughs> Your, your voice jumped up a couple of octaves when you saw the final score ah. uh, from that game. Yeah, I went, ah, <laughs> look at the score. Yeah, no, uh, apparently not K.J. Jefferson's best game. No, I think he's been kind of up and down uh, no. down there. The game of the weekend, obviously, was Alabama-Georgia. We got to see bits and pieces of that. We were sitting in the press box, and I had seen Alabama had scored a touchdown. You know, and, and you're working away after the game or after a after a game. And uh, I asked one of you, I said, hey, what's that Alabama-Georgia score? And somebody said 28 nothing. I'm like, you're kidding. That was your, a shocker. The your fact. voice went up a few octaves might on that have. one. Yeah, well, I, I hadn't had any sleep. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Alabama ends up beating. What an incredible ending to that game. Just the back and forth. Georgia able to come back from the big deficit. And then Alabama, that freshman Williams just looks like oh, a, an, an incredible football player for them. That was, you know – a lot of times you'll get these big time matchups and they just don't live up to the billing and it looked like that's how this one was going to be not so fast i mean it was a thriller that was a game that i'll remember f- for a while yeah I'm a, I'm a heisman voter and so you're watching these games throughout the year and you're just kind of making notes you know it's like okay that game stands out milro the just, way that he played the other he's night he's the heisman favorite right now okay uh, i didn't know that but i mean in my mind you know it's like okay that is a game that i know when december comes around and it's time to turn in your ballots uh, that's a game that you're going to remember for sure. Yeah, I think, if and it's I, not just doing. It's it's just not. It's not just having that performance. It's having that performance against that team in that type of uh, you know big time matchup. Yeah, he jumped everybody after that game. He went above Cam Ward, um, Travis Hunter, the running back from Boise State, Ashton Jean. Well, he had a great game the other night. Yeah, he's good. <laughs> he's he's had two or three really yeah. big games for them this year. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's certainly on the radar. But yeah, Milrow, that game really, really helped him out. And Jackson Dart, he had been sitting pretty as like the number two guy. That thing plummeted. So uh, Alabama, speaking of jumping, they jumped to the top of the line in the AP poll. They're number one now. Texas, number two. The SEC's got uh, four of the top five. Uh, Tennessee, number four. Georgia is number five this week. Texas, you know, you're just watching the score. I didn't see any of their game against Mississippi State. Did watch the highlights afterward. I was surprised that they didn't beat Mississippi State by more based on what we had seen defensively from the Bulldogs before that game. Yeah, and I – yeah, I, I felt the same way about it. That's the, pretty much the main takeaway I had. The the Maybe one of the more fun, memorable moments from Saturday was the pregame when they're – you know, the teams have gone out for their warm-ups and they go back into the locker room and then there's – there's like this 15-minute lull before they run back out on the field, and they're showing the Kentucky Ole Miss ending, <laughs> and you've got everybody in the in the stands. It doesn't matter if they're in maroon, doesn't matter if they're in, in Razorback Cardinal Red. Everybody's cheering for Kentucky, but it was really funny. You know, it's it's coming down there to the to the end of the game, and Ole Miss is facing a fourth and eleven, and they throw like a 42-yard. Yeah. pass that is able to get them in two field goal range of course they missed the field goal and they lose the game but just the kind of the six the uh the collective sigh and grunt that went through the stadium after <laughs> so that funny. Was funny it was really funny um i know i brought this up last week when we recorded but week eight you look at it and there's alabama at tennessee georgia at texas in the same mm. weekend holy cow yeah i mean alabama tennessee that that's always a big game but it feels like it's becoming bigger every single week. And I said it last time. I'm like, I'm curious what they will do for college game day because that is probably going to be the better game. But Georgia at Texas just feels so big too. But Alabama, Tennessee, you're looking at that. By the time that game rolls around, as long as Tennessee handles business against Arkansas and Florida, who knows how high they're going to be. You know, Georgia, they're, they're always a good team, but they got well, they got a, a tough schedule this year because they got to go to Alabama. They've already done that. They got to go to Texas. They got to go to Ole Miss. That's a tough schedule that they uh, they saddled the dogs with this year. And then Oklahoma beats Auburn. OU's down 21-10. to 10. They come back, 
And isn't it just apropos that they win that game on a pick six interception of Peyton yeah. Thorne? It's really funny, honestly. Um, I think that now, ever since uh, you freeze made the comment about beating Arkansas, if they put them the ni- next nine times, any time there's any sort of like really <laughs> bad play by Auburn, it's just almost comical. It's like, oh yeah, I guess that was the that was the one out of ten times that he makes that he throws that pick six. I didn't do great on my picks this week. I think I only went three and three in the SEC, but I feel like I got that one pegged because I said both of these teams have got quarterback problems. But OU's defense really stood out to me, and and then obviously their defense is is what made the play to win them that game. Yep, and I, it's funny because it's almost like they they dared Auburn near the end to throw the ball, and <laughs> because they thought that Peyton Thorne would wouldn't be able to make the right read. You know, this is late in the game. This pick six, I think it was like under five minutes left. It was like oh, I mean, it was four <laughs> minutes left in the game. Yeah, I mean, it was just an utter like that that play was Auburn season in a nutshell. I think. Hugh Freeze will be back out at uh, Baumhauer's tonight, and uh, we can hear what he has to say about that. Maybe maybe they only win that game seven out of nine yeah. times well, if they were able to play again. Yeah, I bet it'll be eight. <laughs> I bet it'll be eight. Maybe it'll be nine out of nine again. Well, you look at Auburn's schedule real quick. Where are the wins going to come from? They uh-huh. go to Georgia. They go to Missouri. They go to Kentucky before the end of October. They played all their home games at the start of the year. Now they got quite the road swing coming up. And you know, you, you get to a certain point in the year – and it's not going well, and the players, they just kind of check out. Yep. And I feel like you might be able to see that with, with Auburn at least going they have down a, the stretch. At least they have a bye week to get ready for the big UL Monroe game because that one could be big for them to get to three <laughs> wins. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're, not, we're not crying here that Auburn uh, is, yeah. is having some, some trouble. Arkansas and Tennessee this weekend, we'll preview this thing uh, as we go throughout the week. As we said, we, uh, we are scheduled to have Houston Nutt on our show tomorrow. We'll be interested to get his take on what he saw from the Razorback Aggie game the other day. Also, uh, looking forward to talking to him about this 25-year anniversary and the new documentary coming out about the Arkansas-Tennessee game, one of the the really great games uh, in Razorback history. We appreciate you being with us today. We'll be back with another podcast tomorrow. And until then, hope we see you on our website at wholehogsports.com. Have a great Monday, everyone.